Thanks very much, Yana. Um, and um, yes, over to me to introduce. So I'm so excited to welcome Professor Jules Gilpeterson um, to this seminar. Um, Jules is Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. Um, she's held fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies and the Kinsey Institute and was honoured by the Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award from the University of Pittsburgh in 2020. Um, and she's the author of Histories of the Transgender Child, published um, by the University of Minnesota Press in 2018. And this is a book whose rigour and ethics and care has had a really profound influence on my own work, and I know it will resonate in that way with a lot of people here today as well. Had a profound influence too, I think, on trans history more broadly. I'm so excited to be able to um, listen to Jules talking in part as a result of that work. Um, and she's talking to us about some new work today, which I'm really excited to hear about. And her talk is entitled Sex and the Antebellum City, the Unfinished History of Mary Jones. So over to Jules. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Kit, and thank you, Yanis. Well, it's such a, such a treat to be here. I feel like it's one of the great pleasures of the dystopian world we live in, that um, the collapse of space and time allows us to be together on Zoom like this. And I, I'm really, you know, delighted by the invitation. I was just saying before the rest of you joined us, this is sort of my last um, to do of the calendar year, and it feels like a wonderful, a wonderful place to land. Um, so I have kind of a, a full, a full talk. Let me share my screen because I do have some, um, some, some slides to offer. Okay, lovely, um, great. So yeah, this is actually. Um, something I've, I've never given this talk before. So here's my very first audience. I appreciate you being game to, to go on this little journey with me. And I'm for that reason, I'm, you know, kind of particularly looking forward to feedback and conversation. This is work very much in progress. Um, and just for a bit of context, you know, I'll, I'll speak more to this during, but this is a talk drawn from a chapter in my next book, which will be entitled A Short History of Trans Misogyny. Um, and this is from a chapter that really tries to think about the question um, that I'll begin with, which is, why do trans women do sex work? The answer is, of course, inflected by how the question arrives. Depending on who you ask, the trans woman sex worker might be a mere stereotype, or her job might be portrayed as an unfortunate product of deprivation, as it often is in anti-sex work feminism. Trans women would do a wide range of work according to the school of thought, but transphobia in the labor force remains an unshakable obstacle. Sex work is often interpreted as the last resort of trans women, much like it is interpreted as the last resort of any women down on their luck. Now the cultural sexualization of trans femininity might offer a better lead, suggesting that trans womanhood is associated with sexual availability in the public imagination. But still, the sort of wrongful intrusion of sex work into what it means to be a trans woman, I think, remains a stumbling block in that analysis. In this day and age, to be a trans woman cannot ideally risk meaning to be a sex worker, just as to be a trans woman cannot mean to be a porn actor or a criminal or a con artist or any other negative trope. Trans femininity is made respectable when it's stripped clean of labor and money transformed into an abstract gender identity. Yet people still line up to pay trans women for sex or to watch them in porn. Those two transactions are widely perceived to be how many non-trans people, particularly men, form their first relationship to trans femininity, rightly or wrongly. But trans women themselves are not nearly as evasive as the men who try to hide their insatiable, so so called insatiable desire, or the liberal feminists who might want to rescue them from sex work. In ethnographic research with Black trans sex workers in Chicago, Julian Kavan Glover stresses that they, quote, have numerous work options and engage in sex work by situating their labor in the sexual economy alongside rather than outside of other types of work. Adding sex work to other kinds of labor, these Black trans women were most like the non-trans Black women in their lives. Taking up sex work as a form of self-investment, Glover's informants refused to exceptionalize their situations because they were trans. 
I look at everything in my life as customer service, explained one woman named Shana, because if you want me to do anything for you, I'm giving you my customer service. My talk today concurs with Shana, and it wonders how long customer service might have been the predominant condition of women like her lodged underneath moral panics about the commodification of sex. Turning back the clock 200 years to a moment when wage labor itself was still relatively new, we can appreciate how long sex work has been pivotal for its trans women practitioners. And among the many stories to be told of how trans womanhood and sex work became entangled is that of a free black woman named Mary Jones who worked the streets of antebellum New York City. Jones, you may know, has sort of become an important figure in the telling of Black history and particularly Black trans history in recent years. But how and why she came into sex work fit into a larger question in the book from which this talk is drawn about the historically trans feminine relationships between race, gender, and labor under a certain uh, regime of political economy. For Europeans or Americans contemplating living as women in the early 19th century, giving up recognition as a man made transition primarily into a loss of status and wealth. Neither of the two prevailing contracts available to women, which is to say marriage or unskilled labor, were there to cushion the dramatic fall. Both demanded a degree of passing that was difficult to maintain over a lifetime. Besides, as wage labor came to dominate the global economy, simply to be an unmarried working woman was already a substantial economic disadvantage. Little remained other than the lowest paid service work, whether dancing in a bar, performing on stage, or selling sex. The lines between those three are not always clear. Understanding trans womanhood as a way of life built into the modern service economy, I think goes a long way to explaining its enduring relationship to sex work. Mary Jones then was one of the first in a long line of black trans women to make that connection pay, though to be paid for it was hardly liberating. And so my talk this afternoon will consider her life in three um, short parts. So part one, the historiography of a punchline. One June evening in 1836, a stonemason named Robert Haslam was out walking the streets like countless other New Yorkers. The antebellum city revolved around what is today usually just called Lower Manhattan, and it was best experienced as a pedestrian. Two marquee avenues, Broadway on the west and the Bowery on the east, flanked a sociable urban environment without many rivals. The richest elites lived in lavish mansions only blocks from working class row houses, the docks lining the rivers, and the notorious slum Five Points. There was no single segregated neighborhood for the city's sizable free Black population, and vice, for which New York was world renowned, was for sale just about everywhere. Instead of confining themselves to a red light district, brothels and houses of assignation played neighbor to fancy hotels, reputable theaters, and working class homes. Visitors to the country's largest city often remarked that Broadway, America's answer to the Champs Elysees, was the place to be seen, not just for wealthy white elites, but also stylish black dandies and sex workers. Everyone seemed to rub shoulders in New York. As a white man with a semi-skilled job, Haslam had a city full of entertainment and pleasure at his fingertips. He wandered a couple of blocks west from the Bowery onto Bleecker Street, where he passed an impeccably dressed Black woman who was also out strolling. Her teardrop white earrings and the gilt comb gracing her hair must have sparkled in the low summer sun. Where are you going, pretty maid, he asked, implying he would like to join her. Making each other's acquaintance, Haslam learned her name was Mary Jones. She threw an arm around him and they walked together a while making conversation. It took only 10 minutes to arrive at a row house on Green Street where what had been implied so far could be negotiated. Haslam wanted to pay a few dollars to have sex with Jones. They didn't go inside, but around back to the alley. What sort of sex transpired is lost to history. But as he walked home afterwards, Haslam realized that his wallet was missing. And in the 1830s, this was, of course, cause for alarm. Many working men carried practically their life savings in banknotes with them 
a much safer idea than leaving them in a shared residence. In that sense, losing your wallet could amount to significant financial ruin. But curiously, there was also now a wallet belonging to someone else tucked into his clothes. Somehow, Haslam was able to track down the man to whom the wallet belonged. The two of them hardly had to guess what they had in common. Among the cautionary tales men told each other about sex workers in the era was that they liked to pickpocket unsuspecting marks. In fact, men routinely took sex workers to court over it and often succeeded in recovering their stolen money. But New York had very few police officers, particularly after sundown. So Haslam and the gullible new friend he had acquired decided to wait until morning to act. The next day, they found an officer named Bowyer who suggested he should try to catch Jones in the act again when he would arrest her. That evening, as the sun set, Bowyer set out in plain clothes on the Bowery, strolling until he saw someone matching the suspect's description. Sure enough, it was Jones. Where are you going at this time of night, he asked her. I am going home, she replied. Will you go too? They walked to the Green Street house and went inside where Bowyer made himself out to be a bit of a strange client. He said he didn't want to have sex in her room. No, he wanted to go out to the alley around back. Jones assented and they relocated. And in the alley, she again signaled that they could get intimate. But instead of returning her invitation, a tussle ensued. As Bowyer tried to restrain Jones, several wallets fell out of her bosom. And one of them was Haslam's. He arrested her on the spot. And while she was detained, Bowyer searched her room inside, finding more wallets. But when he went to search Jones's person, he found something he hadn't expected. His suspect, a stylish black woman who fit in perfectly among the city's many street walkers, was apparently male. Six days later, Mary Jones was tried for grand larceny in the court of general sessions. She pled not guilty, but was convicted and sentenced to prison. Or so the story goes. This version of events is a composite of coverage in the city's scandal-obsessed uh, penny press. It was so well-crafted that many of the details are hard to trust and even harder to verify. How could Jones have been so sloppy as to replace Haslam's wallet with another man's? How did Haslam find that other man? How did the police officer, whose name sounded oddly like the avenue where he met Jones, convince her to go into an alley without raising her suspicions? And wasn't it all a bit too convenient that a bunch of wallets should have fallen out of Jones's bosom at the precise moment of the plot's climax? One or two of those details might be plausible on their own, but altogether they sounded a little more like journalistic fiction than fact, which would have hardly been unusual in the penny press. But does that mean that the accusation that Jones was really a man was also false? Of all the unbelievable details swirling around Mary Jones's arrest in 1836, the one actually easiest to establish is that she was trans because she said it herself under oath. Municipal records for these sorts of antebellum cases were short and handwritten. The Court of General Sessions was not well-funded and rarely even called upon lawyers. Trials were swift and justice quite shallow. And as a result, the trial record is actually only three pages long. Most of it inventories the stolen property. Haslam's wallet valued at 50 cents, $99 in bank bills, and some omnibus stage tickets worth another $2. The total value translates to roughly about 3,200 US dollars today. A single page records Jones's testimony. The scribe summarized most of her declarations, meaning its verbatim status is murky at best. And considering Jones was a free black woman appearing in court less than 10 years after New York state had abolished slavery, her voice was mediated by the incredulity of her white interlocutors. Her testimony began with establishing that she was 32 years old, had been born in New York, and that she made, quote, a living by cooking, waiting, etc. at number 108 Green Street, the brothel where she had taken Haslam. After being asked her right name and replying, quote, Peter Suwali, I am a man, Jones was asked, what induced you to dress yourself in women's clothes? and her answer formed the single longest piece of testimony recorded. 
I have been in the practice of waiting upon girls of ill fame and made the beds and received the company at the door and received the money for the rooms, etc. And they induced me to dress in women's clothes, saying I looked so much better in them. And I have always attended parties among the people of my own color dressed in that way. And in New Orleans, I always dressed that way, in this way, excuse me. The rest of the trial record runs only a few more sentences. When asked if she'd stolen Haslam's wallet, Jones answered emphatically, no, sir. And I never saw the gentleman nor laid eyes upon him. The record doesn't explain the reasoning of the court's conclusion, nor does it list the sentence, but the penny press did, spinning a bit of theater out of the whole affair. The New York Sun emphasized that despite being forced to give her legal name, Jones appeared in court, quote, neatly dressed in feminine attire and his head covered with a female wig. This was meant to play for laughs, as it apparently had in court. The Herald reported, quote, the greatest merriment at Jones's courtroom entrance. And his honor, the recorder, the sedate grave recorder, laughed till he cried, went the article. If the image of the judge in stitches wasn't enough, the son added that someone in the court's gallery, quote, seated behind the prisoner's box, snatched the flowing wig from the head of the prisoner, prompting another tremendous roar of laughter throughout the room. This comedic mise-en-scene is a little hard to believe, but it served at least a narrative purpose. Jones became a lasting sensation in the press. The cause of her infamy, however, was not that she was supposedly a man under her woman's clothing. The satire of her clothes and wig were rather tied inexorably to her being free and black. The Herald went on, Suwali has for a long time been doing a fair business both in money-making and practical amalgamation under the cognomen of Mary Jones. That phrase, practical amalgamation, was the true scandal. There were many sex workers in New York, many open, working openly in the city streets, and only two months prior, the details of the commercial sex industry had been given public airing at a murder trial for Richard P. Robinson, accused of killing a young white sex worker named Helen Jouett. What made Jones distinctly interesting was that she sold sex across the color line. Not long after the trial, a lithograph of Jones captioned the man monster began to appear pasted in shop windows and on brick buildings. In the illustration that you can see here, Jones is the very picture of refined elegance, wearing a fashionable gown of blue flowers cinched in a high waist, delicate white gloves, stockings and earrings. Her look could have arrived on the latest ship from France. She's posed like an elite woman, holding a purse in one hand and a man's pocketbook in the other, no doubt a sly nod to the trial. And her expression is, I think, serene and rather confident, locking eyes directly with the viewer. This conventionally fashionable portrait was intended, like the son's riff on her appearance in court, to be derogatory for white readers. It was not a caricature of mismatched gender, except as part of a racial satire. The sheer pretension of a free Black woman strolling the city like a white woman signaled her duplicity, inviting mockery. The fact that she literally sold sex only sealed the deal. Jones became famous as a satire of abolition in a decade when white supremacists were training their eyes on the city's free Black population. In their mind, if this was how free Black New Yorkers lived, then the national abolition of slavery would inevitably lead to the amalgamation of the races. And that may have been a white supremacist fantasy, but it had already produced very real effects. 1834 had been marked by severe riots over slavery in New York led by seething white mobs. This presentation of Jones's trial as satire in relation to abolition also makes the archival record, as I'm sure you can gather, quite difficult to trust. She exists primarily as a joke in this lithograph, in the antebellum press, and in the occasional subsequent writer's reference. Although her testimony in court established that she was trans in some sense, almost everything else written about her was the punchline or wholesale invention of a white author. Among the worst of those inventions was a nickname, Beefsteak Pete. 
The Sun had originated the moniker in its trial coverage, but it was repeated for years and years by papers whenever Jones was again arrested. Here's a late example from the 1850s. The euphemism suggested that Jones had some sort of leather device to simulate genitals in her line of work. Careful not to risk an obscenity prosecution, in the original article, The Sun gave its explanation of the contraption in pretty horrendous Latin. So it translates literally and quite awkwardly as saying that Jones, quote, had been fitted with a piece of cow, pierced and opened like a woman's womb, held up with a girdle. Now, the fact that the sun mixed up the vagina and the womb, also cow and leather, I think is only one of many reasons not to believe this story, literally. It's hard to me to fathom that the court would have ignored something um, so interesting and, and salacious related to her dress and appearance, although I should say Jones was not on trial for sodomy, not on trial for sex work or any sexual offense at all. Neither prostitution nor interracial sex were illegal in New York, and sodomy prosecutions were just incredibly rare because they were impossible to prove. But I still think it's more likely that the Sun invented the beefsteak to up the ante of libel against free Black New Yorkers and white abolitionists. As Tavia Nyong'o puts it in the amalgamation waltz, the caricature here cuts both ways, certainly against Jones, but also against well-to-do ladies and gentlemen attempting French pretensions along Broadway. The penny press, in other words, was casting impolite doubts as to whether or not Mr. Robert Haslam was in fact deceived at all, or whether indeed gender had not become stylized beyond recognition within the flux of urban life. So it hardly matters whether the piece of leather actually existed or what Jones's anatomy really looked like. Her dress and her earrings were already suspect. Everything about free Black womanhood was so sexualized that it had already been ridiculed by the antebellum white public. So if the archive concerning Jones is so incredibly untrustworthy, then what can Jones possibly say to trans history or to the history of sexuality or to the question with which I open this talk. What does her life explain about the relationship between trans womanhood and sex work? I think the question for me is about how to answer these, or rather the dilemma is about how to answer these questions without falling back into the realm of racial satire, however unwittingly. And to do that, Jones left behind, as far as I can tell, but one piece of evidence. It is the one line of testimony at trial that I trust most, where she may have smuggled in a clue for telling her story differently. I have always attended parties among the people of my own color dressed in that way, and in New Orleans, I always dressed in this way. So that brings me to part two, sex, abolition, and the service economy. In the closest thing available to her own words, Jones did not perceive her way of life to be exceptional. Her trans life was part of the fabric of Black life in New York City and New Orleans. That her assertion survives two years later is kind of astounding. She had already answered the court's question about why she wore women's clothing with a story as old as modern trans femininity. Oh, the women she worked with at the brothel told her she looked so much better as a woman, so she kept it up. So why then did she also emphasize being at home amongst Black people specifically? Why mention New Orleans at all? The references were frankly irrelevant to the legal proceedings. She was not arrested for cross-dressing. Geography was irrelevant to the case. Perhaps something in her delivery convinced the court recorder to pen her declaration. But whatever the reason, taking up this line as historical evidence quickly runs aground on its brevity. Where does a single sentence spoken in 1836 lead us two centuries later? Thankfully, Black feminist historians of slavery and its afterlives have developed powerful methods of rigorous speculation to deal with these moments of utter incompleteness in the record, tools that, of course, Saidiya Hartman calls critical fabulation. And so following their example, what if Jones was communicating something urgent that stands apart from the rest of the trial record in that line? How would her story, how would the historiography have to shift to accommodate the fullest of possibilities embedded in that testimony? Outthinking the satire that immortalized her in the press requires contextualizing two key facets of her life, 
First, her membership in a free Black community during U.S. slavery, and second, her profession as a sex worker when wage labor had not yet replaced all other forms of work. Put differently, to my mind, it can hardly be a coincidence that a Black trans woman's way of life should have arisen in an era animated by tensions between slavery and emancipation and between urban wage labor and urban sex work. And it can hardly be a coincidence that a free Black woman would be well positioned to exploit the paradoxes of antebellum mobility to find her way in the world in a sense that we might call trans. And so by naming trans womanhood as a way of life, this telling of Mary Jones's story lets go entirely of questions of identity. My point of inquiry is trans, meaning something more like a dilemma, how to live in the aftermath of state-sponsored dispossession or primitive accumulation, or prior population level transfeminization, which is to say being coercively transfeminized as a matter of description or projection. For Jones, this dispossession was as old and vast as the transatlantic slave trade. And in this account, sex work is not incidental to modern Black trans womanhood, it is integral to its emergence. Black womanhood had been so intensely unmade over centuries under chattel slavery that what was trans about Jones is entirely inseparable from the story of Black gender during the incomplete transition from formal slavery to capitalist wage labor. The economic and social mobility that came with emancipation in New York was contradictory enough to let Jones transform Black womanhood into something just livable enough by doing sex work. But purchasing that condition of possibility was undercut from the very beginning by a host of national and international forces. So let me dig in there. Jones was born probably in 1803. Four years earlier, New York State had passed the Gradual Emancipation Law, a very conservative form of abolition, granting children born to an enslaved mother eventual freedom. Jones was part of a monumental generation experiencing Black freedom as their predominant condition. And the city's population was also exploding as industrialization and the expansion of American slavery flooded New York's port with cotton and money. In 1830, the city was home to 200,000, an increase of over 60% in one decade, and nearly 14,000 of them were free and Black. The spirit of emancipation and its fragility made for a rather bold free Black community. The free, black, the free Black population had a reputation for the flashiest styles, the sharpest tongues, and trend-setting music and dance. Whether it took the form of envy or resentment, Black people's confidence in public was interpreted by white onlookers as a powerful assertion. The stroll or walking the streets marked free Black New Yorkers as defiant in this short uh, era prior to urban segregation. Otherwise, the street was the place they worked, selling and serving food, street cleaning, other extremely low paid jobs, which were frankly easier to come by for men than women. Any expectation that abolition would lead to economic equality was already hard to maintain. Being restricted to the lowest paid jobs made an already expensive, overstuffed city of predatory real estate speculators tougher for free black New Yorkers than anyone else. By the 1830s, organized labor was openly pitting white men against black men, feeding into the riots of 1834. And more broadly, white New Yorkers resented that their black neighbors dared to live any differently than during the era of slavery. As a hub of black freedom, New York simmered with these local tensions, but of course it was also a magnet in the national and international battle over American slavery. And I think in this context, it's not hard to imagine why sex work was particularly appealing to Jones. The downward mobility of living as a woman was actually minimal on top of the economic situation of free Black workers after emancipation. In other words, Jones was hardly foregoing a lucrative career as a street cleaner or oyster vendor by choosing to live as a woman. And however she got her start in sex work by living in a brothel and doing domestic work, in addition to street walking, she was an incredibly typical sex worker for the era. From the 1820s to the 1850s, the number of brothels sw swelled throughout the city. And while Five Points may have had the worst reputation, the Green Street Row House in which Jones lived and worked was actually almost a mile north. 
Landlords who are making hand over fist off a housing shortage could demand some of the highest rents from sex workers in return for protection. And this tidy arrangement between the sexual underground and the city's elite characterized this antebellum era. Sex work was also overwhelmingly a woman's profession. Like Jones, it tended to attract women who were unable to fulfill the moral imperatives that define the American 19th century, the cult of true womanhood and separate spheres ideology. As cities like New York ballooned into the largest the country had ever seen, insisting on a stark division between public and private space was one way to manage the numeric threat of proletarians. By gendering that line, women and girls could be confined home, not only to keep them chaste, but to keep them economically subordinate to husbands and fathers. And men, in turn, relied on steady work to support their entire family, making it harder to risk organizing against their bosses. Still, obviously for most women, this arrangement was a cheap fiction. The proletarianized European immigrants arriving by ship in New York Harbor couldn't afford private space to confine themselves and they couldn't avoid working. For free black New Yorkers, the situation was even more practical. By the time Mary Jones started street walking, being trans was only one in a long line of reasons why getting married wasn't a viable economic path in life. Now in New York, sex work was really a woman run industry. There were no pimps at this time and most of the commercial infrastructure was owned and operated directly by workers. Even those at the bottom of this hierarchy, the street walkers were actually quite esteemed by the public for their uh, autonomy and self-actualization. Yet it was that self-sufficiency paradoxically that was the same reason that few sex workers ever really made any money. They were devalued in the aggregate for being women and Black women most of all. So while a seamstress in the 1830s could expect to make maybe between 35 and a dollar 10, 35 cents and a dollar 10 a week sewing shirts, a domestic worker might make one to two dollars a week. A sex worker can make that much in a single day, but her expenses were much higher. Brothel rent ran between three to $10 a week. And that was before considering the clothes and styling needed to say fashionable. Sarah Williams, a free black sex worker, for example, charged her clients a flat rate of just $2 in 1835. So ultimately then, whether women worked as seamstresses, domestics, or sex workers, all were poorly paid service workers. So how many of these antebellum sex workers were trans? I mean, there's no way to be certain. Yet there is evidence that Jones was far from alone. In 1842, the sporting paper, The Whip, ran a series denouncing local sodomites. Uh, eight alleged sodomites were named and the paper demanded that these monsters be run out of town. Most of them were accused um, and sort of parodied for their quote, feminine manners, but that charge emulated a much older European tradition of accusing elites of sexual duplicity to dramatize and allegorize their political corruption. So the whip warned, for example, that quote, young men of rather genteel address were gathering every night near City Hall Park, marking, making the area into a quote, second Palais Royal. And the paper also blamed sodomy on actors, an association imported from and pinned on London. But one of the eight accused sodomites was treated very differently from the rest. Sally Binns, for one thing, had a woman's name, and she was a sex worker, not just a sodomite. The whip was sure to refer to her as a man to emphasize the irony, but it also told its readers exactly where to find her, street walking on the four shilling side of Broadway. And interestingly, the column also described her fashion, something it normally reserved for celebratory articles about female prostitutes. Binns apparently had hair, quote, curled down his neck. He straddles as he walks, and if anyone speaks to him, he drops a curtsy. Relating her to the other sodomites it was denouncing, the whip explained that Binns, quote, puts on female attire and enacts feminine parts in the Thespian Association over St. John's Hall and Frankfurt Street. But unlike most actors, she chose to stay in the feminine role outside the theater. Wrote the whip, Binns wears a snuff-colored frock and fashionable pantaloons with watch rings and bijouterie. He has lost all sense and feeling of manhood. As a result, 
He is not quite a woman, by no means a man. Now, Binns was surely white because the whip was so emphatically racist in its depictions of Black people, it wouldn't have missed the opportunity to note that had she been Black. But what's remarkable to me is not just that her street walking is so similar to Jones, but that the press distinguished her from the other sodomites it denounced. While the men were lampooned through libels of aristocratic corruption and decadence, she was written up like one of the paper's darling woman prostitutes. And that reference to the theater is also telling. Perhaps the theater really was a regular entry into particularly white trans womanhood for those who desired it. On a practical level, of course, learning to dress, do makeup, and pass as a woman would be a much safer thing to develop on stage first. What an alibi. And then the leap from acting to sex work could transpire inside the theater itself. Antebellum theaters reserved the third tier, the highest balcony for sex workers who attended with clients or who waited there to be picked up. It wasn't even an open secret. It was a well-known fact of life in New York. The Whip itself published guides to different theaters around town that practically taught readers how to hire a sex worker while they were attending a show. Now, of course, the New York theater scene was modeled on London's uh, down to the sex work architecture, and the occasional story of someone like Binns appeared there, too. One famous tale you may have heard of from the 1830s is a young Irish woman supposedly named Lavinia Edwards who moved into a flat with her sister, Maria, near the Cobrick Theater. Both had dreams of acting. Of course, they weren't really sisters, and Lavinia never seemed to really land a gig, but she confidently told everyone she knew that she had gotten her break acting somewhere, uh, you know, in the provinces. Now, during the winter of, 80, uh, of 1833, she fell ill and was attended by a doctor, but then died suddenly. An inquest was ordered, uh, and the pathologist at Guy's Hospital was surprised to find out that she was male. Now, neither her sister, the attending doctor, nor the landlady claimed to have any idea that she was male, but then a local man apparently came forward offering testimony that, quote, he had seen it stated in the papers that the deceased had come from Dublin. About 12 or 13 years ago, the deceased sometimes passed as a woman and sometimes as a man. The inquest concluded that she had died naturally, but as one chronicler later put it, Lavinia's, quote, natural appearance of effeminacy enabled him to conceal his sex with success. This, together with the fact that he was accustomed to appear on the stage in male as well as female parts, has doubtless helped him. These kinds of tales of deception would soar in numbers toward the end of the 19th century on both sides of the Atlantic, as female impersonation became a particular type of job and profession. But this early in the 1830s, by contrast, Mary Jones, Sally Binns, and Lavinia Edwards were brought into the spotlight because of something initially unrelated to the spectacle of trans femininity. The three had very little in common, except that they worked in the service and nightlife economy. Each of them seems, at least on the surface, to have found in trans womanhood a way of life that amplified their relative social and economic mobility. Edwards, goes the story, was a poor immigrant from colonial Ireland. Uh, and like Binns, the theater merged the possibility of living as a woman with a real you know, paying job. And like Jones, Binns found sex work to be a way to make enough money to purchase that autonomy to live as a woman off stage until she was outed in the flash press. So while histories of trans femininity, of course, can stretch back much further than this period, my point is that the first few decades of the 19th century staged the pivotal connection between trans womanhood and economic mobility that remains quite important to this day. As increasingly wage-driven economies like England and the United States were enforcing a strict gender division of labor, women as a class were experiencing a long-term decline in their economic, social, and political power that of course had begun centuries earlier among peasants in Europe and then spread globally through colonialism. The same historical forces that had violently severed connections between people and land now flooded cities with propertyless proletarians whose ties to family and cultural traditions had been loosened by being forced to migrate to sell their labor. The possibility of sex work for those pushed into cities like New York due to colonial upheaval 
or forced migration in the slave trade made trans womanhood into a real window of opportunity if you were the kind of woman who couldn't get married uh, or even do uh, the kind of average woman's job. It was frankly a chance to start over, to be someone new, which would have been much harder if not for the anonymity of the city, not that it was a form of liberation. I think it was more like a contradiction where new freedoms were tied to new forms of constraint and danger, not to mention, frankly, isolation. While the personal feelings and beliefs of these trans women in the 1830s are impossible to reconstruct, the economic and social currency they pursued, I think, is relatively evident. But the difference is that Binz's affectionate infamy in the whip likely had starkly different consequences for her than the racial satire of Jones, who would end up reported on from time to time well into the 1850s, but always for the same reason, because she had been arrested for vagrancy and sent to prison again. So we're already seeing a fault line between white and black trans femininity in this era in terms of um, the kind of policing and incarceration that it incurs. So this brings me to my last, um, my last section, a little bit shorter to wrap up. Part three, speculation or unfinishing history. Speculation is ultimately the genre attached to Mary Jones, but not all speculations yield the same return. The penny press was given, was given to libelous speculation about her character as a free black woman, never passing up the opportunity to exaggerate the duplicity pasted onto her public image. Jones herself also made a series of gambles in her life, daring to lean into what C. Riley Snorton calls fugitive moments in the hollow of fungibility's embrace. In the larger chapter from which this talk is drawn, I spend a very long section imagining what her referenced trip to New Orleans might have been like and why she would have uh, risked traveling to the capital of the US slave economy at the mouth of the Mississippi Valley. And in short, my argument is that the intense contradictions of the antebellum United States made sex work a sort of trans route into its own sort of speculation. Making work contradictions between racial slavery and capitalist wage labor to return just enough money just enough public autonomy, a kind of quasi or indeed very capitalist sort of freedom to live on, at least until your luck ran out. And of course, contradiction reliably produced its opposite at every turn, the same fungibility attached to black gender that let Jones make a move as big as traveling from New York to New Orleans was what thoroughly criminalized, criminalized her life in a way that resonates for many black trans women to this day, restricting the possibility of ever living comfortably when the police and publicity are lurking around every single corner. But to answer my initial question, I think the reason why trans women like Mary Jones have historically done sex work is kind of simple. It's a job that embraces contradiction for those experiencing severe structural downward mobility instead of doubling down on moralizing work and value. It wasn't that she had no other choice or no choice at all. Sex work didn't replace real work for Mary Jones. She did domestic work and she sold sex because the service economy arose in this era as the informal sibling to industrial capitalism and slavery. If Jones had been born a generation or two earlier and had been enslaved, her womanhood would have been radically constricted by its structural ungendering. If she had been born even earlier than that in a place her ancestors called home, she might have lived a life entirely outside of the Western framework of sex and gender, but she lived in the antebellum city and her life along with Sally Binns and Lavinia Edwards and their contemporaries testifies to how tightly trans femininity tracks in its modern form with historical shifts in state power and political economy. And that all sounds like, you know, historian stuff, but I can't end there. For as much as the rigor of this kind of historical and historiographical and archival auto critique holds me back from saying more about Jones as a person, that one dimension deliberately absent in the archive, I think to just stop there would still be to forego something important. <laughs>
So I will end instead with Salacia, a short film from 2020 by the artist Tourmaline that does what the historical record will never be capable of, show us Mary Jones living out the words spoken at her trial. The film tempers the dizzying mobility and constraints of her life by locating Jones in Seneca Village, a free community where some uh, Black New Yorkers were actually able to own property in the antebellum era before it was destroyed to make way for Central Park. It's very unlikely Jones ever lived there, but the decision to imagine her there is wise. She is now embraced by scenes of Black domesticity and love. She sips tea with other women in their finery. She's at home, smiling in a social world based in Black belonging. She does sex work, but the film shows it on the outskirts of the village, with Jones very much in control. And these choices reframe her subsequent movement at nightfall, giving her a backstory that the archive never will. She walks out of Seneca Village, encounters a wanted poster adapt from the man monster lithograph, rips it down from a pole, crouches over it, and is about to cast a spell when she is apprehended by a white police officer. The film then cuts to her in jail, languishing on the floor, but her captivity remains, in fact, the portal to something much bigger. An eerie call begins to reverberate in the water of a puddle in her cell. A voice calls out and we hear her name. Mary! Mary! The film suddenly shifts to archival footage of Sylvia Rivera holding court on the West Side Piers in Manhattan over a century and a half later in the 1990s. Rivera shares that when she meditates on the water, she can't help but say, you got to keep fighting, girly, because it's not time for you to cross the River Jordan. That River Jordan, the Hudson River, links New York by water to the Middle Passage, but it also links it across time, folding back to 1836. The long life of Mary as a name for both notorious women and queens allows the archival footage to address Jones directly. Rivera reaches back through the tissue of New York and tells Mary to keep fighting. Among Tourmaline's signal accomplishments, I would argue, is reversing the conventional flow of time through the medium of water. So often Black trans women are politically idealized by those who don't know them. Instead of attending to their circumstances or labors, they are claimed as utopian symbols in their manifest su suffering to certify the goodness of those who dare to speak their names. Black trans women are often claimed uncomfortably like possessions by those looking backwards for radical guidance or for help. But in Silesia, Rivera returns to the antebellum era for the inverse purpose, to help Jones not to be helped by her. The forward march of trans history sputters out for something far less expected in this goosebump raising moment, listening to Rivera call out over and over, Mary, Mary. It couldn't be intentional and yet it somehow feels as though that was exactly who she was calling to in that day in the 1990s. Rivera asks Jones not to cross the River Jordan just yet. She asks her fellow New Yorker to stay in the struggle, to keep fighting for what is here on this earth, what in this world needs fixing. And the bridge built between them is not a common identity, a fabulated sisterhood because they live under some sign like transgender. It is a shared struggle on the island of Manhattan, a struggle based in the material stakes of poverty, policing, and sex work that have not only endured the centuries, but were precisely born of that antebellum era. So if there is a riddle encrypted in this speculation, I would contend that it is at once spiritual and historical. In this project of Black and trans speculation to which I hope to humbly contribute, Mary Jones's story, importantly, is not over. Its ending may never be written, precisely like the looping video that restarts Salacia in its installation at the Museum of Modern Art in New York every six minutes. I think the story can't end because it isn't over. <laughs>
And this isn't because some we in the present haven't learned the right lesson from the past or got the details wrong or need new analytics, but simply because trans femininity weaves stories out of the radical inadequacy of the world and political economy that are simply too alive with contradiction for a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so perhaps part of our task is to keep these stories unfinished. Thank you so very much.